If you could please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. If you're new to the Bible, um, you can find Matthew by looking at the table of contents. It's actually the first Bible in the New Testament. New Testaments are the books that were written in the Bible after Jesus came. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, we've actually provided one for you in that colorful pocket in front of you. So you can go ahead and grab one out. And then you can look for Matthew chapter 6 just by turning to that book and then looking for the big number 6. This morning we're concluding our series that we've been in for the past several weeks that we've called Embracing Weakness, the Unlikely Source for Strength. We've been exploring this really countercultural idea that the Bible shows us about how strength comes from, not, not from hiding how we're weak, not from hiding our struggles, not from pretending like everything's okay when it's not, but God actually gives us strength through admitting how we are weak. It is by admitting how we are weak that we can actually set ourselves up for God to move. Because in our weakness, as we continue to struggle and battle and even sometimes fail, God is present in all of that. And, and, and His strength comes to us as we realize we have no strength in ourselves. Right? God moves in weakness to get us where He can take us only by His strength. And so that's what we've been exploring and we've been looking at this idea of, of just our weak human frailty and uh, it's, you know, we're, we've been clear, weakness is not sinfulness. Sin is a choice to rebel against God and go our own way. And so sin is not weakness, but weakness is the frailty of our humanity. It's things that we go through just because we're human. So things like chronic illnesses or relational challenges or emotional triggers or spiritual struggles and questions and doubts or maybe just a personality trait that we wish was a little different. You know, so for example, it's a sin to yell and scream and curse someone out. Um, You know, that's a sin God calls us to love. But it's not a sin to feel tempted and triggered to get angry if something happens, right? Perhaps in our weakness, you know, we're just people who are very emotional and can fly easily off the handle. And maybe there's things in our lives that can just trigger us in different ways. How we choose to act on that might or might not be sin, But the fact that that temptation is there is not sinful. The fact that that temptation is there is just a reality that we are weak people. And so if we show up at our small groups and say, listen, I'm really struggling with anger this week. It's been really hard for me. I feel like I'm tempted all the time. That does not make us less mature Christians. In fact, it actually makes us more mature Christians because we are being open about how we can be weak. Right? That's just being honest. But if we show up and say, hey, listen, this week I got really angry and I shot someone... That's obviously a little different conversation. We've moved from weakness to sinfulness, and, you know, the cops are probably going to be involved at that point. But um, sinfulness is meant to be fought and resisted, but, but struggles and challenges, guilt, shame, grief, mental health things that we can go through, bodily health things that we can go through, emotional triggers that we can have, those things, those weaknesses are not things we should be ashamed of. But they're actually things that God can use powerfully in our lives to show us how strong He is. To show us how He makes people who are weak strong through His grace. This is what we've been exploring. And and one of the things we've seen uh, as we were in, for example, 2 Corinthians 12. We saw Paul talk about his thorn in the flesh. Or as we were in Psalm 88 and we saw Heman just crying out to God in despair. Or last week as we saw... Uh, how we need to have our identity in Christ and how that's the armor of God for us. There's actually been a little bit of a subtext taking place, uh, another theme that's been developing, and it's this. In each of those scriptures, prayer plays a prominent role. And so in 2 Corinthians 12, it says that Paul did what? He, he pleaded with the Lord about his thorn. In Psalm 88, Heman says that his prayers rose to God day and night. In Ephesians 6, we're told to pray for ourselves and and pray for one another as we struggle and wrestle with our weaknesses and the spiritual battles that they can bring with them. And so the testimony of Scripture 
is that one of the primary ways we experience God's strength in our weakness is through prayer. One of the primary ways that we experience God's strength in our weaknesses is through prayer. But here's why I know it can be true. As soon as I mention that, prayer can often be one of the areas that we feel most weak in. At least I can know it can be that for me sometimes, right? As soon as we say prayer, we immediately go to how we feel like, well, I don't pray enough. Or when I do pray, I don't know what to say. Or when I do pray, I get really distracted. And so we try harder. We read books about these people who are these great prayer warriors. And, like, we want to be like them. And so we try to emulate what they did. And maybe that works for, like, a day. But then, you know, it just gets hard again. And we're, like, five minutes into our prayer. And we're totally distracted again. And it's just this vicious cycle that prayer makes us feel weak. It's meant to be a strength for us in our weakness, and yet because it exacerbates our weakness at the same time, we can actually neglect it. But as we come to Matthew 6 this morning, we're going to see Jesus teaching about prayer. And I think what he might be exposing for us is that our problem with prayer actually, I think, often comes from a misunderstanding of prayer. I think the weaknesses that we can feel in prayer is because we actually don't understand fully what Jesus himself teaches about prayer. And so that's what we're going to be looking at in Matthew chapter 6 this morning. I'm going to read verses 7 through 13, but I'll be honest, we're going to be focusing pretty much on just one phrase. But I'll read the whole thing to give us some context. Let's, let's read in God's word together. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 7. Jesus says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Would you now join me in praying that God would bless the preaching of his word. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, we come to you now, and we just pray that you would meet us in our weakness right now, Lord God. In our weakness, there are distractions. In our weaknesses, there can be misunderstanding about even things that get said. And so, Lord, I pray you just come. Spirit, you would help us in our weaknesses. I pray you would give us not just ears to hear, but you would give us hearts to hear, that we would be open to what you want to say to us today, Lord God. Thank you that you want to meet each one of us where we are, and thank you that you don't want to leave any of us where we are, but you want us to continue to grow as we hear from your word. So please, would you do that work in us, Lord God, Will we grow into maturity today in Christ just a little bit more. We're just asking just for a little bit. If you do a lot, praise you. But we ask just for a little bit, God. Would you take a little bit of truth and connect it to a little moment of our life that we might experience a little more growth so that more and more we might give you glory in our lives. And Lord, we want to remember that we're not the only church in Philadelphia that meets here today. And so we thank you that there are other places that are proclaiming your gospel. And as is our habit, Lord God, we, we want to remember another church by name. And so this morning, Lord, I want to pray on behalf of City Life Church. I pray you uh, bless Pastor Brad Leach and his family. I pray you would anoint him as he preaches your gospel this morning. I pray you would build that church and add to that church and grow that church for the glory of Jesus' name. We praise things. Amen. Amen. So in this passage, we see Jesus really setting up two different ways that we can pray. He, he starts by talking about how the Gentiles can pray. That. That's not a word that we use often, Gentiles. Um, but for Jesus, that would have meant anyone who is not Jewish. It's actually a translation of the word pagan. And when, I don't know about you, but when, when I hear that word pagan, I can think of, you know, godlessness or someone with low moral character or something like that. But that's not what pagan meant for Jesus. For Jesus, a Gentile pagan just meant someone who, who wasn't part of the Jewish people. Right? And, and Jesus starts by speaking about how they pray. And, and actually, these, these pagans are not godless at all. In fact, they're actually very religious people. Did you see that? Verse 7 says that, that they heap up 
a lot of phrases. They think that they're heard for their many words, right? These are people who believe in God, and they believe in prayer, and they pray a lot, and they pray long. You know, I think if you and I saw them, we'd probably be like, wow, look at all spiritual those people are. Man, I want to learn to pray like them. <laughs> you know, these people, they, they've got it together. But Jesus is not impressed. Jesus is not impressed by their many words and phrases. He actually calls them empty. He, he, he says, do not be like that. Right? Verse 8, do, do not be like them. Jesus does not want his followers, his disciples, to pray like these pagans. Why? He tells us why in verse 7 when he gives the reason for why they pray. Here's why they pray so long. They think they'll be heard for their many words. Jesus' problem with the pagans' prayer was the fact that their confidence for them being heard by God was in themselves and how well they prayed. Their their focus was on themselves and what they were doing instead of the God that they were praying to. And I think, if we're honest, this can be very easy for us to do as well. (laughs) Right? We can think, hey, if we just learn how how to pray the right way, if we just... You know, man, it's been so hard for me to have my quiet time in the morning. If I can just get my quiet time, that's going to be the trigger that's going to change everything and, and make me this prayer warrior that I want to be. If I just figure out the right system, if I find the, the helpful app, you know, if I try really hard, if I learn how to focus my mind and go into my prayer closet. And, you know, we put all this effort into figuring out the how of prayer. But according to Jesus, that's a dead end. That, that, that's how the pagans pray. In Christian prayer, in praying as people who follow Jesus, who are, who are his disciples, who have placed their faith in him, Christian prayer is not about how we pray or where we pray or when we pray. What Jesus is showing us here is that Christian prayer is about understanding who we are praying to. The difference between pagan prayer and Christian prayer is that pagans focus on what and how Christians are meant to focus on who. We are meant to focus on who we are praying to. This is what Jesus shows us as he says in verse 9, pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Jesus does not start with saying pray then like this, in the morning, with this many words, in this type of way, for this types of things. He does not start with any time. He does not start with any technique. He doesn't tell us how, when, or what. Jesus starts teaching us about prayer by talking about who God is. When you pray, you need to know that you're praying to your Father in heaven. So here's what Jesus is teaching us right from the start. Prayer is not about technique. Prayer is about a relationship we have with God. And not, as I say, relationship, you know, it might not be a relationship where we feel like we are experiencing God, right? We've seen over the past few weeks that there have been many people praying, but they haven't been feeling close to God at all, right? Sometimes we can pray, and we can feel like God is not even listening, but but, they, but we saw that these people have kept on praying. Why is that? Because prayer is a relationship in the sense that we are recognizing who God is and who we are to Him. And so this takes us to our first point this morning. And I, I've got three. Here's, here's number one. We're going to look at the God of Christian prayer. We're going to look at the God of Christian prayer. We, we read this phrase, our Father in heaven. And it, you know, it sounds very familiar to us, right? It's a common thing to be said. But here's what we have to understand. For these original disciples who are hearing this for the first time 2,000 years ago, you know, those who were present, right? Matthew was there talking with Jesus. Um, He was there when Jesus said this. This phrase, our Father in heaven, would have knocked them out of their seats. Right? That word Father to us sounds very formal, but the word that Jesus uses actually is, is very 
intimate. And and Matthew wants to make sure that, that his readers got how intimate this is because if you're reading this in the original language, Matthew wrote this in Greek, but in this prayer he takes a break and he quotes Jesus directly in Aramaic. Right? Jesus is Jewish, and so he would have spoken Aramaic. And the word that Jesus uses in Aramaic to describe Father is the Arab word called Abba. It's Abba. And Abba is not a formal term at all. It's actually very informal. Commenting on this, theologian and pastor James Boyce, the late James Boyce, said it this way, Abba was the address of a small child to his father, meaning something similar to daddy. To a Jewish mind, a prayer addressing God as daddy would have not only been improper, it would have been irreverent to the highest degree. Right? Jesus' first followers were all Jewish. And for thousands of years, they're the previous generations that They had prayed to God, but their prayers took place in the temple in very formal and ritualistic ways. They were used to addressing God as Yahweh, the God with the unspeakable name. In the Old Testament, which were the books written before Jesus and and were given to the Jews, in the Old Testament, God's referred to Father only seven times, and, and never by an individual. He's described as the father of the nation. That, that's as close as he gets. And so no person would ever dare approach God with so much familiarity. These disciples, as they hear Jesus saying that you can call God daddy, they had no category for what he's talking about. Jesus is completely changing their understanding of what it means to pray. Now, our culture doesn't have much problems thinking about God in intimate terms like this, right? We actually, I think, sometimes can almost have this expectation that, well, yeah, of course God should be a fa- our Father, right? Of course He should be like this. We're all, we, we use this phrase a lot, like, we're all God's children. That, that, that gets passed around. But please notice, Jesus is not teaching here that we're all God's children, Right? He's, God is clearly everyone's God. God's clearly everyone's creator. Every person is made in the image of God. and so therefore has value, worth, and dignity regardless of what they believe or how they act. Every person is made in his image. God is everyone's creator. But Jesus tells his disciples to say what? Our Father in heaven. Right? He's not just saying, hey, God is Father in heaven. He's saying he's our Father. Right? That's how siblings speak to one another. Right, you and I can't talk about our father, right? Like I have a father and you have a father and they're not the same person, right? But with my siblings, we can talk about our father. And so think about what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is the son of God. And Jesus prays to his father all the time. Over 27 times in Matthew, Jesus is quoted as, calling God his father as he prays. And so his disciples, as they're living with Jesus and spending time with Jesus, they would have heard Jesus praying this way to God, but now Jesus is including them. He's not just saying he's my father, he's saying he's our father. He's our father. I'm the son, and when you're with me, you're now sons and daughters of God too. Right? The, the pagans heaped up pray, like prayers to God, their maker. But Jesus is the one who invites people into a relationship with God as father. As daddy. He gives us this, this unique access to God because we're now with Jesus, who is God's son. To, to, to illustrate this, there, there's a cute story, and I'll be up front, I'm not sure if it's actually true or not. Um, do you know not everything you read on the internet is true? I'm not sure if you knew that or not. But, um, but anyways, it's, it's, it's a cute story. There, there, there's, there's a story about a young boy who really looked up to Teddy Roosevelt. He, he liked 
um, you know, him is kind of, if you know anything about Teddy Roosevelt, he was like, you know, the rough rider and this cowboy who became a president. And this little boy was his hero. And he, he wrote letters to Teddy Roosevelt. He just wanted to meet the president. He wanted to do whatever he could to meet the president. He went to the White House and he actually got obviously turned away because you can't just walk up to the White House and like ring the doorbell and expect to meet the president. And so he got turned away, and he was very discouraged by that, and he's sitting there kind of, you know, upset and, and, uh, about it. And this other little boy comes up to him and says, hey, you know, what's going on? And they start talking, and, you know, this little boy says, I just really want to meet the president. And, and the other little boy says, oh, okay, well, I know a way in. Come with me. And so they walk up together, and, and they come up to the Secret Service, and, you know, um, the Secret Service says, oh, they greet the other little boy by name. Oh, hi, Archibald. Good to see you today. He's like, yeah, it's okay for me. My, you know, me and my, I'm going to bring my friend in. Oh, yeah, sure, no problem. See, that little boy had just met the president's son, Archibald Roosevelt. And, and the son was able to get him in to the White House to see the president. But that boy was dressed a little shabby, so this Archibald, it's actually really sweet, went one step further, and he took him into his room, and he gave him some of his clothes to put on, so that way the boy could have a jacket when he went to meet the president. You know? and, and the boy had his dream come true as he went into the Oval Office. It's, it's a sweet story, but, but here's, friends, and it might or might not be true, but, but it's absolutely true for us in this sense. When we place our faith in Jesus... He is the son, and so now we get access because we're with God's boy, right? When, when we come in to meet God, we come in not just clothed in us, but we come in with Jesus' jacket on. We come in dressed not in our shabbiness, not in our sinfulness, not in our filth, not in the things that we are ashamed to even admit to ourselves or to others. We come clothed in who Jesus is. Except Jesus gets us even a little bit further in than Archibald Roosevelt did. Because Archibald Roosevelt brought, G- brought the boy in and he got to meet the president. But for us, when we get in to meet God, he's not just God. But now all of a sudden, we're not just meeting the president, we're adopted into the family. And we get addressed as sons and daughters of God. And also, for this boy, it was very easy for him to just take his clothes off and put the other boy's clothes on. For us, we know that was not anything easy at all, but for us to be clothed in Jesus came at a very, very high cost. We get to put on Jesus' righteousness, as we heard this morning as we were singing. We get to put on His perfection. God sees us as never having sinned, not because we haven't, but because we're clothed in Jesus and who He is. But the only reason we can be clothed in Jesus is because Jesus has taken off our clothes and put them on himself. The only reason that we get the access of the Son is because the Son of God came and took on our sinfulness on the cross and died on our behalf. Jesus put on our clothes so that we could wear his. And Jesus putting on our clothes meant that Jesus got treated like we deserve on the cross. He, he died the death that we deserve so that our clothes could come off of us and so that now as we place our faith in Him, we can be clothed in His righteous robes. And we get in, not to see the president, but we get in to be adopted by God as His very children. And so friends, every time we pray, every time we pray and we dare to address the transcendent, holy creator of the universe who holds the stars in place by the words of his power, every time we think that we can actually call him Father, do you know what we're experiencing in that moment? We're experiencing the gospel. Prayer is an experience of the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done. Prayer is not something casual or easy at all. No, our ability to pray came at the highest cost possible. Our ability to pray to God is only possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can now call God Father because the Son has brought us to him. And so every time we pray, we're praying to the Father because of who Jesus is as God the Son. Every time we pray, we are experiencing the gospel. And so we are now welcomed before God as His Son.
Do you know how God views you when you pray? He views you like Jesus. The love and affection that God has for his son, Jesus Christ, if you are united to him by faith, that's how God views about you too. This is what Jesus is inviting us into as he dares to say that we can address God as our father. He's like, it's not just my father. Through faith in me, he's now our father. You're now brothers and sisters with Christ, which means God is our father together. And this, this totally changes everything about how we can pray. If this is the God of Christian prayer. This then takes us to the manner of prayer. The manner of prayer. These pagans, right, they thought they had to approach God in a certain way, in a particular manner. You know, if I do this, then God will listen to me. Prayer is very ritualistic. But Jesus is telling his disciples that they can come to God as their father. It's not about what you do. It's about whose child you are. And so Jesus is framing prayer as this relationship of a child to their father. And again, not just any child, but actually a child who is very young. Right? That, that, that's how we're meant to think about ourselves as we come before God in prayer. And so think about young kids, right? You don't even have to have young kids. Just spend time with them for 30 seconds. You'll realize that young children approach life a little bit differently than we do. You know? But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, let the little ch- children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. In other words, in order to get with God, you need to learn how to be a child. You learn how to be a child. And so let's just think for a little bit about Jesus inviting us into this relationship of addressing God as Abba Father. Like, what does he mean when he's saying that we can come to him as Daddy? Well, you know what I think that means? Think about how kids come. Kids come messy, right? Kids don't sit down and try to clean themselves up before they go talk to their parents, right? Like, they don't even know how to clean themselves up. Like, my, I've got two boys. Their version of cleaning themselves up is just rubbing the noses on their shirts, right? They're doing good if that's happening. You know, a few days ago, I came home, and my youngest son, he's three, comes running up to me, you know, daddy, 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 and he just comes and gives me a big hug. And, you know, he didn't stop to think that he has peanut butter all over his hand. And now I was also enjoying that peanut butter sandwich, Right? It just it doesn't even enter his mind that he's supposed to clean himself up before he addresses me. No, he just comes as he is. He just comes as, we, as he is. Friends, in our prayers, we can come to God as we are. We can come to God as we are. We don't have to clean ourselves up. We don't have to take off the grime of our discouragement. You know, we don't have to address each and every one of our doubts. We don't have to come, you know, without our insecurities. We don't have to come when we no longer feel shame. No, we just can come in all that messiness of our weakness and our human frailty. We can come in all that and just wrap our arms around God and call him Abba. We can come as a mess. We can come as a mess. You know, kids also, they don't just come with mess. They don't always come with the right words, right? Like young children do not always speak with proper diction, you know? And and I'm not going to sit my three-year-old down and tell him, now before you speak to me, you have to make sure you address me properly, right? Like when he asks me to clause the TV so that he can go get a snack or something, I don't say, listen, like unless you say pause, I'm not going to do that. I don't know what clause the TV means. Like we're not having this conversation. He's three years old, right? Like I'm just happy that he's actually saying anything, you know? Uh, you know, when he says, you know, things like, I love you, Daddy, I'm not saying, listen, son, that's unacceptable. The word is love, you know? Like, no parent does that, right? You're just grateful to hear from your child. We're in the car the other day running some errands. He's in the back. He's just babbling, and, like, I'll be honest, I don't even know what he's saying half the time. Like, I got no clue. Um, but I'm just so grateful. That I'm like, this is, I'm in my car, and my son's just feeling free to talk to me. That brought joy to my heart. That just brought joy to my heart. Friends, we, 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 I think we need to get a little bit better at learning how to babble. I think we can get a little bit better at just realizing that, you know what, I don't even know how to pray. I don't even always know what to say. I, I don't know the right words, Lord. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed. Lord, I don't even know what to pray about right now. But I just feel like I need to talk to you. I don't even know what the right words are. I don't even know what I'm trying to say. I'm too weak to even gather my thoughts right now. I'm just praying. I'm just praying. Would you come? You know, would you meet me? Right? We're just babbling. We're not even making sense. You know, 
But God loves us so much that he hears those prayers. And not only does he hear those prayers, he loves us so much that I, I love this pro- promise in, that we're given in Romans 8, uh, verse 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Friends, God hears our prayers, even in our weaknesses, when we don't know how to pray. And God cares so much about hearing from us that he actually has given his Spirit to offer prayers for us. Right? God is our translator. And so I think we need to learn just to be little children and and be okay with our babbling prayers. And be okay with our babbling prayers. Kids also, if you, know, you spend time with kids, you'll notice they'll, they'll ask things repeatedly, like again and again and again. You know, my older kids, I have two older kids, eight and six, and they're, they're starting to get the idea that, hey, we can have back and forth dialogue, but when mommy and daddy give you know, a decision, like you know, at that point, you know, okay, like we say, hey, listen, we're not going to watch something now. That's like the big thing in my house, like watching TV. So um, God gives us plenty of opportunities to address the idols in our kids' heart through that. So we're like, hey, listen, we're not going to watch TV today, but we'll watch it on the weekend. Like, they get that concept, right? And they'll, they'll stop asking because they know, okay, we're waiting for Saturday morning. But my three-year-old doesn't get that, right? My three-year-old has no concept of time whatsoever. So us saying, okay, we can do it, you know, on Saturday. Well, it's Thursday. Guess what we're doing from Thursday to Saturday? Every couple hours, he's going to be asking, is it time now? Is it time now? Is it time now? You know, we made a huge mistake. My daughter's birthday is in March. And, you know, at, at her birthday, we said, hey, Aaron. Aaron's my youngest son. Hey, buddy, after this, your birthday's going to be next. And his birthday's in July. I don't know what we were thinking. Um, no joke. Every day from March to July at his birthday, praise God, it's now happened. But, like, it was, is my birthday day? Is my birthday day? Sometimes multiple times in the day. Like, he'd take a nap, and he'd wake up from the nap and be like, is it my birthday now? <laughs> no, buddy. Still not your birthday. Um, You know, kids, kids ask repeatedly. But you know what? I don't mind him asking repeatedly. Because it, it just shows me what's on his heart. And you know what? I want to hear what's on my son's heart. I know that I'm going to give him the right answer at the right time. Like, I know what I'm going to do. And I know that he doesn't fully understand it. But I still want to hear from him. I still want to hear from him. Right? It's okay to ask repeatedly. To continue to pour out our hearts to God. God is not frustrated with your repeated prayers. God isn't disappointed that you haven't gotten over this yet. God's okay with you asking again and again and again and again and again. And just pouring out your heart to Him again and again and again and again. He wants to hear those things. Because you know what's really happening in this? When we are coming to God and we're repeating ourselves again and again, we're acknowledging our inability and we're trusting God's ability. Right? Why, why does my son ask me for things? Because he can't bring about his birthday party himself. He needs daddy to do that. And that's why he's asking me again and again. And that's why I'm okay with it. Right? Because every time he asks me, it's an expression of his trust in me. It's an expression of him believing that I actually want to give him a birthday party and do the good things for him, right? Like he's saying something about me just in the question. And so, friends, we can go to God with our questions. And maybe we're not getting answers, right? Maybe like my son, we're frustrated and we feel like the answer is not coming when we want it or how we want it. And yet, God wants us to continue to come with that. And God's not frustrated by us, but it's okay to keep coming. And it's okay to come with nothing to offer, right? Kids come, and and they don't make bargains, right? Like, when my kids, you know, they come to me and they ask me for stuff, I don't turn around and be like, well, let me think. What have you done for me lately? You know? Like, when my youngest son asks me, he's like, hey, Dad, can you you pour cereal for me? I'm like, well, let's see. When's the rent payment due? You know? Like, I mean, maybe if they're 21, that's a different conversation. You better believe he's paying rent. But, uh, But, you know, when he's three years old, that's not the expectation, right? Like, he's, he's a young child. There's nothing that he can offer me, really. Like, what does he have that, you know, like that's going to be of value, right? But that's not how we relate. We don't relate based upon a transaction. 
It's not about, okay, well, I'm going to make you cereal this morning. And so you know what that means? I'm going to make you cereal. You better not get angry at all today. You know, I'm going I'm gonna, to, I'm gonna, you know, take you to school today. I'll tell you what, if you go to school, you know, you better, you better listen to every single word. Like, obviously, I hope he does that, right? But, like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do regardless of what he's doing, right? Our relationship is not transactional. I'm going to be his father because that's who I am, and he's going to get these things because he's my son, and that's just what's going to happen, right? Like, we don't have transactions, and, and that's how God wants us to approach him, friends. We don't come and, okay, God, listen, you know, um, I promise I'll be at church this many times if you do this for me. I promise I'll give this amount of money if you do this for me. I promise I will give this up, you know, every Friday if you do this for me. God's not looking to relate to us based on a transaction. God's looking to relate to us based upon a relationship we have and an understanding of who he is for us. You know, if my kids came to me and, you know, on a Christmas morning and I'm giving them presents and like, oh, dad, thank you so much. Here, let us pay you back from them. That's actually going to be insulting, isn't it? Like, I want them to just receive, you know? Friends, we don't have to come to God with anything in our hands. We don't have to come to God making bargains. He is our Father in heaven. And so we can come as we are with nothing to offer, but all we have is Christ. But that's all we need. That's all we need. All we need is the Son, Jesus, who makes us sons and daughters of God. It's not about transaction. Prayer is not transactional. Prayer is about relationship. And this really leads us to the final point this morning, which is the hope that prayer brings. The hope, the hope of prayer. Friends, we have a tremendous hope in knowing that God is our Father. And he welcomes us before him in prayer. In our weaknesses, in our insufficiencies, in our struggles, the fact that we can come to God and we can talk it out and we can vent it out and we can ask for help and we can be distracted and we can be weak in our prayers and yet we're still heard because he's our father. Friends, this should give us tremendous hope. This should give us tremendous hope. Because our Father hears each one of our prayers. Not because of how well we pray, but because of who He is. God being our Father means that He hears each and every one of our prayers. Not because of what we do, but because of who we are now in Christ. God hears all our prayers. And God answers prayers. Kristen Cato is not in a wheelchair right now because God answers prayers. Carol Donahue has eyesight because God answers prayers. Angie and I were told that we could not have children because of complications with my Crohn's disease, but Sophie, Judah, and Aaron are answers to prayer. Friends, we experience answers to prayer, and I could go on and on illustrating things, and I think it's very easy for us to explain that away of, oh, well, Kristen's out of a wheelchair because she got on the right medicine, and Carol got, you know, is her eyesight because... Um, you know, the doctors were able to do something, and Jeff and Andrew were able to have children because the doctors were wrong when they said you couldn't have children. You can explain things away, but I tell you what, God, yeah, he works in such a way that things can look seamless. And so, yeah, I could choose to explain things away and act like it's just coincidences, but I choose to live with hope that there's a God who answers prayer. God answers prayer because he is our Father and maybe you don't have a good father on earth, but don't judge God being your father based upon an imperfect example on earth. He is the perfect father in heaven, and he's defined himself as a father who withholds no good thing. And that's not just words that he's saying, but something he's proven by not even withholding his very own son. Right? God has proven that he is so for us that he came and died on the cross on our behalf. We can know that God is our loving father because he's the God who gave his son so we could be adopted into his family. Friends, this is the God that we're praying to. This is the God that we are praying to. He is the God who's for us, and he's the God who promises that he will answer our prayers. 
But I'm sure as I go through that list of answer prayers, and maybe there's a list that you have of answer prayers you can praise God for, I'm also very aware that there can be another list. There can be a list of unanswered prayers. There can be a list of things that we feel like God is not listening to us about. And that can be very painful. And that can be very hard. Two weeks ago, as we were studying Psalm 88, right, we saw Heman have unanswered prayers. And it actually didn't end with like him getting any of his prayers answered. We don't know the end of his story. It just ended it with him saying, God, I feel like you're not hearing me. And yet we saw what a testament that was, the fact that he was praying to God, even though he felt like God wasn't hearing him. There's so much strength in the struggle. But but we can have this, this painful sense of unanswered prayers. And so what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Well, friends, friends, when we are living in the unanswered prayer, we have to understand that because of Jesus, God is now our Father. And you know what? He's our Father who's going to bring us home. As Christians, I think we often can get so focused on the here and now that we can forget where this story is going. I think it's very easy to allow the pain of the present page that we're on to forget that this might be a page, or this might be a couple chapters, but this is not the end of our story. Friends, as Christians... who who have come into relationship with God as our Father, we know that He is taking us to the end of our story. And that at the end of our story, every unanswered prayer, every ache of our hearts, when we get to the end of our story, each and every one of those prayers will be answered. Friends, for the Christian, the answer to our prayers is never a question of if, it's only a question of when. It's only a question of when, because here's where our end of the story is. John, a follower of Jesus, who saw Jesus rise from the dead, he had this vision. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Friends, this is our end of the story. This is how things are going to be in our Father's home. When we come home to be with our Father, every aching prayer will be answered. There is no addiction in heaven. There is no grief in heaven. There is no loneliness in heaven. There is no anxiety in heaven. There are no chronic illnesses in heaven. There is no longing for loved ones to be saved in heaven. Friends, in heaven, there is no tears. There is no cries. We are with God as our God, as our Father. And there is nothing but satisfaction forever. That is where our Lord is taking us. For the Christian, every answer to our prayer is always yes and amen in Jesus Christ. It's not a question of if. It's just a question of when. And so we can pray and we do. We pray for a taste of heaven now. Oh Lord God, come and give us a taste of what we will experience then. Come and give it to us now. And we pray for healing and we pray for deliverance and we pray that the Lord would help us. And there's nothing wrong in those prayers. God hears those prayers and praise the Lord. Some of those prayers do get answered on earth. 
But the great hope is that every prayer will get answered in heaven. And that is what we're holding out for. That is what we're holding out for. And we know that that's not just wishful thinking. We know that that's not just something that we're trying to conjure up belief in. How do we know that we're going home? Because our big brother Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. Our big brother Jesus has proven who he is by dying and then doing something a little bit dramatic to show that he's God. He rose again from the grave. And so we believe this, not because it's words in a book. We believe this because Jesus is no longer in a tomb. He's not a tourist attraction that you can go see in Israel. Jesus is in heaven, and he's the one who has promised that he's going to bring us home. Friends, our hope is as real and as true as the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. That's why we know these promises of God are true. And so friends, when you're struggling with the when is this going to happen, continue to relate to God as your Father because you know that the risen Son is at His side. And so as we kind of bring things to a close here and and wrap this series up, you know, we talk a lot in this series that you know, God doesn't call us to fix people. You know, we, we can want to do that. We can feel like God's got to fix someone, right? We see someone struggling, and in our good intentions, we just want to fix it. And so we, we run to a Bible verse that will make it go away. Or we share a testimony of, hey, here's how I went through something, and God got me through. So that means somehow that that's going to get you through. And listen, Scripture verses can be helpful. Testimonies of other people can be helpful. But they don't fix anything. And sometimes we run to them so fast, it actually can be hurtful because it shows that we're speaking more than we're listening. You know, I think, friends, here's where I just want to kind of close us with. As we see people struggling, and in our love, we care for them. What if, instead of trying to fix them, we just started praying for them? Like, what would it look like if instead of trying to, you know, type words in our concordance and find the perfect verse, we just, not knowing even what to say, kind of babbled to God on their behalf? Like, what would it look like to pray more than we spoke? And if that's not true for us, you know, think about what we're communicating. If we're just trying to rush to fix people and not praying for people, we're thinking that somehow in our own strength, we're going to be able to do something that God can't do in His. Friends, God can do more in a moment of prayer than He could do in a lifetime of our efforts. And I've seen that be true again and again and again. Praying for someone. God, would you meet them? They seem distant from you. I don't know what's going on. All of a sudden, there's a a sin they get caught in that exposes everything, and now they're set up to meet God. Or they're coming and they're confessing, and they're opening up. You know, the Lord just, He works, friends. He works through prayer. And so I think the question that really I just want to leave us with as we think about embracing weakness and seeing weakness in one another, friends, let's be committed to pray for each other. How, how do we care for each other in our weaknesses? We pray for one another. We pray for one another, right? We, we listen to each other so we know how to pray. You know, in order to pray for someone, you have to kind of know how to pray for them, which means what? You have to be able to listen to them, to understand what they're going through. Not that you'll ever fully get it because each person's pain is their own, right? We can't fully get what someone's going through. We can try to understand what their struggles are. We can try to understand where they're coming from. We can meet them in their mess, and we can pray for them on their behalf. And so, friends, I just pray that we would believe that God's our Father. And therefore, because of that, we'd be able to go to Him and pray ourselves. And we'd be able to grow in prayer for other people. This is how we experience God's strength in our weaknesses. We pray to our Daddy who cares about us. Let's just go ahead and pray right now.